Hello guys, David here. I hope you're doing well. Um, I have an absolute treat of a podcast for you today. I'm joined by Jonas Dodu of Speedworks. Jonas is a world-class, world-renowned sprints coach, speed coach. Um, he's worked for many years with groups and groups of elite sprinters. And he has worked also sort of in track and field world. And then he's also worked in kind of field sports worlds where he's worked with a lot of athletes and clubs and organizations in football and rugby and American sports and and um, a, a variety of different sports. So he, he knows how to coach speed and look at speed in just in, in any context, I think. So um, he's an absolute legend of a man. He's an absolute gentleman. Um, I really enjoyed having a chat with him today. We chatted all things, obviously, speed, uh, biomechanics of speed, what are the big principles he's looking at, what are the big things that we can look at. Uh, we talked about like the importance of the control over the pelvis and what that means for him. Um, we talked about rehabilitation, hamstrings, biomechanics, all, all of that stuff. So a really good chat, and um, I think you're really going to enjoy it. I definitely did. Before I, so the podcast was at like 9.30 a.m. Irish time, and on the way here, I went in to grab a coffee because I was like, I need to give myself a G up for this podcast. And I went in, ordered, or I said, okay, usual oat milk, flat white, please. Um, very hipster of me. And then I looked outside, I was like, oh, it's nice and sunny out. Maybe, and I said to the barista, maybe I'll get a, an iced latte instead, iced oat milk latte instead. And I said, yeah, I'll get, I'll, and I said, can I get an iced oat milk latte instead? And he proceeded to give me out my iced oat milk latte and then went back to the coffee machine and then proceeded to give me my oat milk flat white as well. And like any good Irish man, if you're getting a haircut and it's the worst haircut in history, you say, that's brilliant, thank you very much. <laughs> And, and you leave, so I paid for both coffees, I drank both coffees, so I was a little bit, um, I was a little bit giddy talking to Jonas, but I think I was going to be anyway, because I was kind of fangirling over him a little bit anyway, so, um, so yeah, if, if, if you catch, if you catch my, 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 um, my giddiness, not my giddiness, then that's that's what you're sensing there. Uh, just one thing on the member site, don't forget to join us on DGR Interactive. This is my little read. I need to I need to move my phone out of the way so I can read. So this week uh, we put up two videos. One was a plantar fascia case study. I'm looking at a, a foot, a client of mine. It's like a 10 minute video I'm looking at. Here's maybe why some of the reasons why he has plantar fascia or not why, but some of the some of the things you can observe at the foot and some of the things that we can maybe look at and see, okay, I'd like to change this, this and this. And here's some things that we can spot. So that was uh, the Tuesday video. And then the Friday video was uh, hook lying versus a 9090 position. So I was asked the question in the group, um, why would you use? So in lower body basics, there's a lot of 9090 stuff in the interactive site. Then there's some hook lying hook lying variations for some of our hip exercises our hamstring exercises our breathing exercises and when would when would you use one versus the other so two videos this week two videos every week and live classes and all that stuff so don't forget to join us there use the code dgr podcast excuse me i'm joking on myself for 20 percent off so go and sign up for dgr interactive but for now here is jonas dodu from speedworks i hope you enjoy no yeah, you be- can record because because i i was i wanted to talk to you like when we were coming up with the podcast coming up with the list i put you on the list and um i i waited and waited and waited because i was like he won't know who i am so i want to be like right i've done 20 episodes and here's the other names and then you might say yeah i'll come on i know who you are i knew you were you were from maybe over a year and a half ago um i know that i was talking to some of the england rugby guys and then they're like obviously because of sullivan being you know working for those guys no, and they straight away referenced you. I talked to the guys in NBA and NFL. A lot of the medical guys have referenced you, you know. And so you're 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 more you're more um, big time than you think. So of yeah, all the know. podcasts, yeah, I'm I've got COVID, little... mate, and, and I've taken all the drugs I can this morning just to be ready for this podcast. Right? I said to my wife, I'm not doing the school run. No, no matter what, do all the other stuff. I need to be ready for Davis. So. Well, I um. Well, I'm, I'm, I was nervous for two reasons. Well, nervous, jittery for two reasons. One, because I was nervous talking to you because all the other people or most of the other people I can hold a good conversation with about different things. But sprinting, I can't like, you know, it's not. I, I think I'm OK at like looking at the mechanics and a little bit of the theory and then just the graded exposure side of it. But like I have no mm. experience in anything past that, like where, OK, mm. the athlete is now returned and. I have no experience there. And if there was one part of coaching I'd like to get into just for my own interest, 
there would be more of that because I missed that as an athlete as well. I got zero amount of that. I, I'm really happy to help you in any guys because my I think my biggest evolution as a coach was when I injured my athletes and had to work closely with physios and had to understand their process. And I had a really good guy who's in Ireland at the moment, Ed Mias. He works for uh, Irish Sevens. Um, and he um, worked so closely. I was so interested by what they were meant to return to that we were integrating performance-based training into rehab. Mm-hmm. And then I was looking at it like, it's the same thing. It's absolutely the same thing. And so actually I became uh, massively interested in rehab and in, in sports therapy and all of those things and to integrate it into my performance training so that it was one and the same and so we've got a reputation for athletes getting injured but coming back really quickly like most people in track and field over the past five or six years that know me and will follow my squad will go oh uh, Daryl's got a little niggle or an injury it doesn't matter we're not worried about her we know in six weeks or 12 weeks when she's back she's going to be in better shape than she was prior and almost on many occasions, I'm not, I'm not proud that my athletes have got injured, but on many occasions, they've come back really fast or if not faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been a learning, mes- learning uh, I guess, a, a learning moment for all of us. Yeah, I think you learn a ton from injuries and working in the rehab side a bit because you get quicker feedback usually than in the, in the performance world because you know, like a really healthy athlete, it might take months to just nudge them forward a little bit where they've been a high training age or something like that. But then in the rehab process, someone has pain and actually you might introduce just one exercise to them and the pain is gone or one thing. Yeah. And you see their confidence shoot through the roof or their mechanics change. So you get feedback very quickly. And that then applies to, you might learn something about your healthy, high performing athlete just from doing that other stuff. So that's where... Learn a lot. I mean, if we took emotion out of injury, we would learn so much more mm-hmm. about just systems and system development. Because if you look at F1 car, if you treat an, you know, an athlete as not a machine, right? They're human and they've got emotions and chaos and all that stuff. But um, if you look at F1 driving, or if you look at, I don't know, a, a factory that has different, lots of different processes and standards they need to hold things to you've got a traffic light system red amber green right and okay there's a red light on our dashboard saying this is wrong actually that's just information okay right let me go and work on that now we know what to focus our attention on as a team um every department is working towards making sure this thing works so that the the car can go faster right Mm -hmm. and so actually if you want to evolve in your um process you you need you do you hopefully you don't get a red flag right but you, you need those amber flags to or amber lights to give you some direction towards what to go and work on or what to focus on so i think a good a good early athlete reporting system a good screening process in in the performance world so that your testing is your training your training is your testing each training component gives you or the athlete or both um, and the therapist some information about how they're functioning on that day um, some good awareness of KPIs for those components and just general performance. Um, so if we talk about KPIs as key performance indicators, Dan Paff um, always t- used to talk about K- KPLs, key performance limiters. So we, we need a list of both to be really clear about what are the different things we should be watching for and screening. And, and then actually a niggle, a bit of pain, discomfort, change of, of pattern of movement, and, uh, compensation or change of strategy, Those are all signs that kind of um, make me go, okay, how do we address it with coaching, with exercise prescription, with recovery, regeneration, um, with with, uh, manual, almost like coach-led, therapist-led solutions, with um, athlete-led, athlete-empowered solutions. And we're constantly going back and forth with those things. So injury is an opportunity, is really what I'm trying to say here. And and I think that the best systems um, need to fail forwards. What, what are you looking at then 
well, I know everyone is different, but is there something when you look at someone, when you look at someone coming in and let's say they haven't reported that they feel tight or they're real tired or whatever, and is there things that you can actually see in their movement that's like, that doesn't look quite right, whether it's like they're a little bit slower off the ground or something like that? Um, yeah. Yeah. What? And is there things that we could maybe try and look for? Yeah, for sure. I think that... Um if we talk about sprinting first and, and this is a summarize of sprinting is just like large forces in a short amount of time in the right direction. That's what I think sprinting is. And then if you spiral down the research and spiral down this muscle function and, and the time we have on the ground is too small and too low, low for um, concentric action to be the guiding light. So we know that it's far more about how do you create pretension in the air so that by the time you hit the ground, you have enough force to spike your ground contact. So this phrase spike your ground contact just refers to the force curve that might happen or the force trace if you saw a force plate. And we want, we want large impulse, which could just in, imply that we want uh, a curve that is flat and, and big and round like a pimple. But no, we want a sharp curve because we want it to, we want to get to high peak force in a short amount of time. Right. So impulse in a relatively short amount of time is what we want. So that's what we call spike your ground contact. So we want people to attack the ground. Um, and so maybe the term switching is important to describe here. And, and um, there's some Japanese research that looked at um, uh, limb coordination uh, and limb exchange coordination. And they talk about these two elements, one called the switch and one called the scissor. And the switch is really about agonist antagonist timing. Does your rep frame and hip flexors turn off early when you get to the top so that your extensors can turn off? Simple as that, right? And they've described it to show that actually less efficient athletes, and I would argue um, fatigued athletes will more likely have poor timing. And so they've measured it all to show you that look, EMG trace and everything is, rep frame is still on, hip flexors still on when extensor group are turning on and there's now creating friction in the system. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, the, that's the, uh, the switch of one limb. Now the scissor is how I would describe the switch of two limbs, which is just have both of those limbs turned off so they can both exchange and turn on. And do they have a good thigh angular uh, acceleration and velocity, right? Mm -hmm. that, that is the, for me, the major driver of sprinting and, and performance, accelerating, decelerating, change of direction. It's all about how much thigh angle of velocity you can apply and how well you are at orientating it using your trunk, your center of mass, your hips, right? And then all your feet are good, of, um, are, are there for is to, to take that force, to recycle it through the ground, give you a stable base to have good hip extension. And so, I'm looking for those things. Um, a, a word, there's a few words that maybe also summarize this. So in acceleration or in upright running, I'm looking for trunk discipline, shin discipline, and bum before back. Mm -hmm. And all bum before back describes is um, uh, a proximal to distal uh, extension pattern, essentially, yeah? Um, people might talk on lumbar pelvic disassociation and lumbar pelvic control. I think we're, we're, all, we're all talking about similar things. Can you, you're gonna have some extension in your lumbar spine, of course, but have you got um, enough, uh, is that driving your extension or is your bum driving your extension? And so my analogy is always, if I think on an RDL, you might be at the bottom of a, you might be at the bottom of an RDL and then what initiates you to stand up? Does your shoulders go back and you almost flare your ribs and you almost do like a good morning action? Mm -hmm. Or actually, does your bum drive you forwards and your, your shoulders move as a result of your, your pelvis moving under you, mm -hmm. right? And so, one, two. Okay, so in, in that description, those are the key things that my coaching eye is looking towards. Do they have good trunk discipline and good shin discipline? And trunk discipline is just, okay, can they extend, rotate, do all the, the normal actions that we want, but without having to flare or side bend or do all of those compensatory, compensatory actions in order to um, enhance hip flexion and, and hip extension. And I say enhance, it might just be create fake hip extension and create fake 
hip flexion, right? Mm. They're just finding ways around to, to uh, around their restrictions to achieve the task. So if I see an athlete who generally has decent uh, frontal plane control, has decent sagittal plane control, and, and then turns up and maybe one side is more than the other, I'm going to question that. That's, mm. that's my question mark. If I see that, um, uh, you know, what, what is normal first, that's where I probably should have started, what is normal for the athlete? And then if now suddenly I'm starting to see that um, their, uh, their switch is poor at the top, or maybe the switch is fine at the top, but it doesn't accelerate all the way into the ground. Mm -hmm. So I'm now asking myself, why are they um, limiting their ground reaction? Are they purposely not driving into the floor or do they still have the function of driving, but they want to dampen their landing? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm asking myself, why are you protecting yourself from these, these destructive forces? Because the forces sprinters are putting through the ground are huge, right? And if you don't have good ankles, actually a better survival process might be to not hit the ground as hard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, um, uh, so I've talked about trunk discipline, what's going on, sagittal, frontal plane, um, how are they controlling rotation and how is that changing? I'm thinking about limb exchange. What are they doing on the front side? I'm thinking about limb exchange. What are they doing on the back side? You know, if you've got an athlete that tends to have a decent range of motion behind themselves, but suddenly has restricted that range of motion, I'm going to question that same way to the other way. If normally they have a, a, a medium range of motion and suddenly now they've got huge range of motion behind themselves, I probably would look to their pelvis and their trunk discipline and ask mm -hmm. myself, how have they achieved that? There's mm -hmm. only so much hip extension you can have. So if they've now suddenly got more range of motion, they probably had some front, uh, they've probably leaned forwards and lost control of their lumbar spine mm -hmm. to gain that range. So I, I have to keep asking myself, you know, based on what is normal for the athlete and, and based on what I see, um, how are these key pieces of trunk discipline, shin discipline, lumbar pelvic control, a bum before back, how are these things um, uh, changing and adapting and compensating in order for them to reach their task, which is large force, short time in the right direction. Mm -hmm. okay. We could do 10 podcasts on that. And all that. <laughs> the, uh, I need I'm to gonna pause try and... for one second. I need to get a charger. I'm very sorry. Yeah, um, go for it. Go for it. I can ramble. So if I'm rambling, just cut me off. No, you're good. You're good. The rambling is good. I'm going to try and kind of summarize some of that maybe in my language. And you can, you can tell me if I'm on the same page yeah, or I'm right 100%. or wrong. Um, no, so good. don't be afraid to tell me, no, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> so firstly, what I want to say is we, we taught a workshop on Saturday. It was like a return to return to play type of lower limb rehab. And I was just running through my basic assessments when I first see someone like a toe touch, a squat, stuff like this and rotations and people were saying i was trying to break down like in in your standing rotation you you can see this you can look at the spine you can look at the rib cage the pelvis the knees the feet and a couple of people were asking me where like wh what sequence do you look at the mean like are you doing five reps where you look at the first thing the first time the second thing and i was just like i just can't it's hard for me to answer that question because i just kind of see it all happening and then you know, and, and, and then obviously something like sprinting or acceleration or whatever is, is so much more complex. Everything is happening faster. But I know how hard that is for you to answer that question where it's I, I, I'm looking and I think something is not quite right. But it's hard for me to put into words to you why I, I see that something's but some, I just know something is a little bit different than it was yesterday. Yeah. So, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Um, so is the question, where do you look first? No, there's no, there's no, there's no question, but I just like that, that just, it's just basically, I think about reps of looking at movement and then you're saying something's not right here. And mm. yeah, it's just hard to, hard to articulate okay. that to yeah. other people. I think it's traditionally been hard for even in a, in a healthy athlete to articulate clearly, concisely to everyone what we see. It's always been hard because we, some people, we all see different things. Um, my, my wife is an Olympic athlete. She's learned to watch some of the fastest people in the world with her eyes. I played rugby and came into track and field really late. 
So I learned by watching video in slow motion. Dan Path will teach you watch your video forwards, backwards, slow, normal, zoom in, zoom out. And, and actually when I sit with my wife, who's got an amazing coaching eye, she'll be like, don't show me that crap in slow motion, right? Show me in normal time. Mm-hmm. And she'll watch it in normal time because she's what she's, she's, I'm gonna say listening. She's kind of feeling um, sequencing and timing. And it's very difficult to, to feel that or see that with slow motion, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas I am a bit of a computer and, and we've, I've poured my brain into an algorithm in, in an app that we're currently using. And so now I think that most things that we would intuitively say, oh, I feel this is wrong, we can measure. We're now at that point. So with nearly every running technique, with every different um, variable that you can think of from a kinematic perspective, a lot of the time it, it, it points towards something we're seeing with our eyes or feeling but can't articulate. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're, but you're hundred percent right in your point that it does take reps. Like I've, I've got terabytes of video from training. Like I share some online, but people really don't know how much video we collect. Um, and the types of athletes that have been successful under us are very visual learners. And, um, and I guess the team sports guys over the past three or four years don't have the time or, um, expertise to learn what we learn or learn what we know but using visuals is being a game changer because now we're not relying on a language you know mm-hmm. the problem with language is always perspective if i were if you were standing in front of me and i drew a w on the ground i will see a w but you will see a m and then right mm-hmm. someone to the left and to the right of us are seeing e's and threes and roman numerals like everyone's confused whereas at, if we put down a picture of an elephant and everyone can see that elephant, no matter what perspective you are, you will recognize it as an elephant. So that's the direction that we're going with coaching at the moment. And I think that that is far easier for coaches, therapists, everyone to almost jump a few rungs of the ladder to be able to really focus in on what matters. Yeah, that's so good. I love that. Um, Then on your, I actually had written down bum before back uh, because I've heard you mention that before. And you actually shared a post. The only, the only, I didn't even know if you, if you knew me then, but I knew you shared a post of mine where I, I showed a guy, a big guy pushing a car. Do you remember that? Um, and he was pushing a car out of, out of a car space. And I wrote down hip extension before back extension and hip yeah. extension before knee extension. And those bum before back. So Dave O'Sullivan is someone that talks about that a lot. Franz Bosch talks about it in terms of the proximal to distal sequencing. Um, and the energy transfer and yeah yeah i saw you saying like bum before back and i was like yeah it's it's that's that maybe that's the way to explain it to an athlete bum before back you don't need the the other terminology and i think when you get bum before back you're going to get you're not going to get back extension before hip extension and you're not going to get the knee extension early either you just it, it all comes from that hip it all comes from the hip exactly and there's this phrase or this term Lombard's paradox, right? And, and that just describes um, the fact that your knee extension can happen as a result of hip extension, as long as your ankle and, and shin are stiff. So that's why I talk about shin discipline or pinning your shin. If you've got really good ankle stability and good stiffness through your ankle joint, um, you can have a relatively stable shin. It will roll a bit, but a relatively stable shin that then allows you to have your hip move early and keep moving, not be decelerated by the fact that your knee is dropping. And um, that just works really well together. It just, it just paints towards the, this need for the whole system to be in tune and happy to work together for efficient performance. And you can have drops of hip extent, so you can have a reduction of hip power that is a resultant of your ankle being an issue or resultant of your shoulder, your shoulder, uh, uh, your shoulders in general, maybe going in the wrong direction or being restricted in rotation. So you can't get, you can't make big shapes. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, yeah, bum before back, I think is a big deal. And um, uh, a lot of the time it's like, if you want to make someone faster or, or let's say more efficient in running and sprinting, then um, you don't just wait to coach that movement and coach the concepts during sprinting. You do it everywhere else. You do it when it's non-complex. You're on the ground doing some general activation. Are you just letting your guys do general hip bridges with a massive curve in their spine up and down? 
or actually are you starting to already get them to think about and understand what they should be doing with their midsection, how quiet their spine should be when their hip is, is in action. And you can take that same concept across to nearly every single thing that you're doing. And so for an SNC coach, a lot of SNC coaches or physios will say, well, sprint training is for the sprint coach or the fitness coach or whatever it is. And I will say, no, it's your job to send well-coordinated, um, confident people who know how to be bum before back, who have the lumbar pelvic disassociation and the, and the movement control so that the, the fitness coach doesn't have to fight fires outside on the pitch. They can focus on outcomes like go faster, go further without having to um, break it down into those real internal cues, which you might need to, to make those changes. Mm-hmm. We're speaking the same language here. That, that's why I, I get frustrated with people like where it's like, okay, go into the gym, just get stronger. Like it doesn't matter how you perform the lift, just get stronger, just get stronger. And mm. I, I think it, it absolutely matters. It spills over into how I see people moving straight away because they go and do their deadlift and it's just, it's just, driven all by back extension and there's a couple of things then like of course of course their back is going to tighten up they're going to they're going to maybe lose a little bit of range of motion at the the switching that you're talking about that disassociation like of course they are because the pelvis is going forward all of the time and and a heavy heavy deadlift for a strong athlete is a strong stimulus that their brain is going to like adapt to so then you do see that you see the athletes who've done tons of that and then that's how they go and run so I think just get stronger. It's not. It's not a bad principle, but but like how we actually do it is is really important in the gym. And I I do think we can have more carryover to to how we run and how we how we play sport. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and there's a few things to unpack there. So, fifty um, percent of if we we do a regression analysis um, on uh, on a group of players, and we've done it a number of times with different teams. What we see is about 50% of what explains performance in acceleration, specifically here, is comes from our physical profile. So we, we may do some vertical uh, uh, force velocity profile testing, but basically we, we want to know maximum force capabilities. I'm just going to say it that way. We want to know maximum posterior chain strength and power. Um, we want to know ankle reactivity and we want to know some kind of horizontal jump. So all of our testing metrics are kind of around those kind of activities, most times of a force play, sometimes of other means. And then from a sprinting perspective, we take kinematics. So we, we measure them over 10 meters. We measure step length, step frequency. We measure how they do that, and we put them into groups. And if you just take physical profile alone, you can describe 50% of performance. Great. If you take technical, you can describe about 60%. But if you take the physical and technical together, you described uh, more than 85%. And, and that's what makes sense. And really all I'm trying to illustrate here is that um, when you get a young buck, the low hanging fruit is, yeah, get stronger, 100%. Easiest way to increase performance, robustness, confidence, all sorts. But actually the way you get stronger will either limit you or allow you to keep getting faster, right? Um, and that's, that's sometimes the problem is that in the early stages, coaches, parents, players um, feel that, oh, I did six weeks of training and I felt this good. And I did another 12 weeks and I felt this good. So I'm going to do another two years and I'm going to feel, no, no. The low hanging fruit, just, you just keep picking higher and higher to get, to get a point where you're not really getting much anymore, especially if it's a general program. If there's some real specificity within that program, and what I mean there is, if you understand from a kinematics perspective, a running perspective, the low, the, the weakest link and the, the KPIs and KPLs, and then your gym program is feeding um, the solutions for that, then you can keep getting faster. But what you'll probably start learning is that to improve, it's not just maximal strength. Maximal strength is great, but actually my certain components in my eccentric cycle is the issue. So I need to go and work on that. I need to break quicker. I need to, um, I need to be more reactive or I, I need to, with a lower weight, be able to move faster just in general. You know, there are other components to just maximal strength. And then my, my story here um, kind of leads to Joel Fearon. Joel Fearon is the fastest winter Olympian ever. He's a sub 10 runner. He's an Olympic medalist in the bobsleigh. Um, and he um, is really intuitive as an athlete. 
And so generally, as he gets to about week six to week eight of, of his general, general program, so that his winter training, he will say, I cannot, I don't want to squat heavy anymore. He'll be adamant. And the thing is, he's already lifted very heavy by then and he can keep lifting and he's got a massive PB. He normally wants to, uh, when he's about 10 to 15% away from that PB, he would rather move his double leg squat to a single leg activity and, um, and a belt squat or something else that will allow him to have good spine discipline. And the point is that in his running, uh, even though he looks like he's low, he because he, he can be at a low body angle, he throws his hips up in the air in his early acceleration. Mm -hmm. And his massive KPI for performance is actually to push his hips forwards, not up. And he says, I can't control it when I get really, really strong because my back is what makes me really strong and my back throws me up. And, and this is just alluding to the point that exercise selection and, and um, exercise selection specifically here can be really critical because you may be able to keep getting stronger in exercise, but it might start to take away from your actual performance goal. Mm -hmm. And so keeping the main thing, the main thing is really what matters here. Mm -hmm. So I had a, a conversation with Daniel back from his jump science on Instagram. We talked a lot about specificity and um, in the gym and stuff. And so you see a lot of people like sports specific doing things that look like a running action in the gym. And maybe for you, then maybe I'm putting words in your mouth here, but being kind of specific to sprinting some of the time is actually getting your your hip extension before your knee extension in some of your lifts or your hip your bum before your back in some of your lifts and that's like there's so much longevity in that learn to lift like that in the beginning so first six weeks me as an athlete when i was 20 years old went to 18 years old went to an off season first time really lifting i was very slow before that came back for for a pre-season and I felt like I was at 25% faster. I could not believe it. And I just, I just was just, someone wrote me a program. I was just throwing weights around and I just got stronger. Mm. Um, but so I think most people will experience some level of that, but then they, they, they maybe run out of room because it's how they're actually doing it. So does specificity to you then some of the time mean just that's how you do it. Like you're, you're looking for them, them components in your trunk discipline, your shin, your, your, your bum before back and then is there a time when specificity comes in where you're actually trying to be more specific to Moving sprinting pads. or running yeah yeah okay i understand your point um both i think when we look at this word dynamic correspondence i'm not gonna okay let me say this correctly when we when we want to be specific and maximize training transfer into performance. What we're doing in the gym, in the field, we want it to turn into what we do on a game day or in a race. Um, we can look at motor pattern specificity and like the, the, the real dynamic correspondence. So choosing exercises like bounding to um, pulling a sled to various sprints because they look like um, the, the action of sprinting, they have a similar um, timing. So it's not just they look like the running, but the timing and the forces are closer to sprinting. The velocity is closer to sprinting by all means. Um, but even under those things, I wouldn't be saying a, a squat or a deadlift or a um, box jump is not specific. It clearly isn't because it doesn't have the same actions. But I would ask myself, what are the underpinning physical qualities in order to create the forces during my bounding and during my, my jumps, during my sprinting? And some of those qualities can be developed in very non-specific actions. So that's, it's, it's almost like I'm talking about this tertiary transfer where you're not getting any direct transfer because the movement patterns aren't similar at all, but the motor unit recruitment, the synchronization, the, the, um, just the uh, strength to weight ratio, the, uh, the eccentric force requirement, or the, all, all of the things, the co-contractions, the you're not gonna get the timing and real good coordination parts, but you can at least develop some of the physical and some of the underpinning neuromuscular that then allows you to do those other tasks. Mm -hmm. So I, 
so firstly, I, I, would, I should just start by saying, in my program, there's a bit of everything. Slow movements in the gym, barefoot walking, uh, general circuits with med ball and hanging off bars and doing lots of, of um, uh, you could call it bodybuilding, pull-ups, leg raises, etc. cetera. Um, heavy lifting, which is slow, uh, plyometrics for, for fast SSC and slow SSC, um, lateral movement and, and, and rotational movements, I think are just as important for sprinters because when you get everything right in a straight line, your limiting factor becomes your ability to control your frontal plane. And actually the easiest way to coach and, and, and teach that is to just coach them like you're doing groin rehab and like you're preparing them for rugby. Mm -hmm. So my sprinters train like rugby players who are getting ready for agility and the rugby players sprint, train like sprinters are getting ready for a straight line run. And there's a mix of everything, right? Um, so I, I do believe you need all of those things and there are going to be key things within that that have real primary transfer to the event, some that are more secondary and some that are really tertiary. But I think we need all of them. The difference would be if you're doing a 12 week cycle or six week cycle, whatever it is, that you need to move from slower to faster, simple to complex. And as you're moving towards your goal to peak or to be ready for your sport, some of those, the, the, the priority, the proportion of training is what reduces in order for the priority to increase, right? So my slow movements are a big, my heavy strength weight, my, my, um, my low level conditioning is a bigger priority in the earlier phases. And it becomes less of a priority towards the end. Mm -hmm. And then that, enables a few things that enables you to focus more on the types of contractions and movements and, and exercises and, and stimuli that you really need that allows for you to recover and not have to compete from an energy and, and adaptation perspective with all those other things um, because here's a reality slow heavy strength is great for preparing tissue but terrible for the nervous system and coordination so there's a reason why this term um, short to long is used in sprint development. Short to long is a really simple term and it essentially might mean if you've got 12 weeks to train a sprinter that wants to get ready for 60 meter sprints, maybe in the first three to six weeks, you actually do more fives, tens and 15 meter sprints. So you can work the technique in a safe environment mm -hmm. whilst you are building physical capacity, work capacity through other lifts, through multiple jumps, through some running conditioning. Um, and then gradually you add distance to your sprint work to expose them to higher and real intensities whilst you almost go, I've done enough of this general stuff. I'm going to find a maintenance dose to keep some work going, but to spare some energy and coordination for the other side of the system. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely feel like I've gone off on a tangent, but I, I, I'm really, what I'm saying here is the gym in my mind should remain the gym. The gym is for slow, heavy movements. The gym is for work capacity. The gym is for injury prevention. Now, in team sports, do I provide people with programs that in the gym, they're working on switching, they're working on coordination? Yes, because they rarely will do that work out in the field. If you're on the field, you're in your boots, you're playing the sport, right? But in a track and field perspective, we keep the gym the gym. And gradually over the year, they can spend 90 minutes up to two hours, if I'm honest, in the gym in a bit in the early stages. And it shrinks to half hour, 45 minute segments by the time we're midway towards the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And um, what does when it shrinks there, it, it, it grows on the track and it might grow in the initial track session because we're doing more speed work. But often after they've done their sprint work, they go into the gym um, they do a little segment and go away and do more plyometrics or do more explosive work. Or, or we, we review Monday session and we say, look, this is what was an issue. And Wednesday, we add some extra components that are maybe a lower intensity, but an opportunity to learn by rote or problem solve some of those issues. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the last point here I would say is we gym to jump. That's my, that's almost my heuristic. We gym to jump. The reason I gym is to have the the coordination and to have the qualities needed for me to work on the key attribute in jumping. That's my issue. Is it my breaking phase? Is it actually getting out the hole quickly or is it my concentric phase? 
that's that's as simple as that we can look at it. That's triphasic training really for a dummy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the gym is there to first allow me to train, give me work capacity, and then to, to, to really support me jumping. Yep. So you've mentioned a lot of stuff there, like your short to long, the, all the gym stuff. So I'd like you to try and help me with a hamstring rehab, let's say, right? Okay. So I'm not going to be too specific as to what tissue is injured or how, how injured it is. Let's say someone hurt their hamstring a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, pain is gone. They feel like, right, I have... I'd rather it be maybe like a field sport athlete of your choice, yeah. footballer maybe if you want to choose. And I know everything is, it depends. So like, I'm not going to pressure you that way, but can you take me through your thought process on like, right, in, reintroducing load and then how you reintroduce speed and yeah, what, what, like what that, what that actually look like, it looks like. I think a lot of people have an idea of what it looks like in the gym but then when you get onto the onto the pitch it's maybe just like okay run tomorrow or next week few days time run a little bit faster run a little bit faster so how what's a what's yeah. a better way for us to think about that okay fine i i think that um before the athlete was injured they were doing a certain amount of training so the critical thing for me firstly is to see what plan b what plan c stuff can i continue with as they are in the early mid stages of rehab. Um, so I'm, I'm not even caring about sprinting right now. I'm just, I'm just wondering what are the contradictions to, uh, it's not contradiction, isn't the word, uh, whatever the word is that- Contraindications. Kind of, contraindications, exactly. Yeah, what are the I, contra I'm not good with that word either. I might not have got it right. <laughs> um, uh, and and where, 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 what can I do and what can't I do? So I would ask my physio, what can I do? Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a distal, it's a distal hamstring. Avoid anything that is going to be opening, closing. We don't want to put much stress on the limb. Okay, can I keep a straight leg? Can I do straight leg scissors? A lot of the time, my rehabbers very, very soon after being injured are into very small straight leg shuffles or very uh, semi ballistic uh, pogos. Um, where we want to keep the pelvis alive because the first thing that happens when you have an injury is you just you would rather do everything in your power to not spike your ground contact. So you will leave your pelvis in anterior. You would rather be far more knee dominant and hip dominant. You will just change your strategy for being elastic. You'll find a way. Instead of spiking your ground contact, you'd rather maybe push off longer at the end. Yeah. So you need you, you, at the end of the day, you're going to find a way for locomotion. So I want to, within a safe period of time, um, for, okay, firstly, I, I want to keep this, the system alive. I want to keep some of that reactivity, keep the firing. I want to watch what's, what's your new compensation with your pelvis and your trunk. And I want to reset that straight away, 100%. Um, and then, uh, so I'm going to find exercises that allow me to keep your switching going, keep that feeling of being reactive without damaging the tissue. And quite frankly, I'll be honest, I, I'm going to watch and listen. Every day we're going to do the same set of drills and I'm going to, I'm going to ask them how much, how much can you do? I'm going to watch what can they do? And I'm always going to save myself by 20%. If I feel you could do 20% more than it means the session stops and, and I've won. As long as we can have small wins every day, we seem to get people back soon. Um, the analogy we use, and you want specifics, but the analogy we use is that we don't, um, if you have a flat flat tire, you don't just park your car for three weeks and come back to it and expect that it's changed. Yeah, you you go about doing things to to address it. Um, uh, what 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 are the key things for me is that often when I have a hamstring injury, the hamstring rarely, unless it's a low trained athlete, rarely in in let me say this in the right way, in in guys who have decent programs, rarely is the hamstring the issue. The hamstring muscle for guys who have got a decent workload rarely is the weak point. I'm almost always coming back to the pelvis. I'm always, always asking myself, what was the hamstring doing? I think it was dealing with the locomotor task of attacking the ground aggressively, as well as trying to stabilize and support the pelvis. So when, I, when we have hammies, half the time we're addressing the pelvis more than the hamstring. We're waiting for the hamstring tissue to heal. We're going through, you know, isometric, concentric, eccentric progressions. We're, we're, 
We're doing the normal things to respect the timeline of recovery, but we're being bloody aggressive with everything else. Mm -hmm. And and, and actually, a lot of the time, players and athletes train harder during rehab because they don't, as in they train harder because they don't have the running load from their game. They don't have the stress from the technical, tactical demands and they're with us. And I see some people come in, do some loading, get on a bike and go home. And I'm, I think that is, that is terrible. If you're at a football club and normally the uh, response, the normal timetable is you come in, have your breakfast, do some training, maybe you do some gym straight away, have lunch, go home. That might be the normal routine for everyone. If you're not injured, you're doing double days. 100%, you're training like an athlete and you're doing everything. Um, so I don't think I've gone very precise. So let's talk very precisely. So firstly, just a question there. Actually, just to, just something I saw from you guys or maybe one of your physios or something before, it was actually re- related to a calf injury and it was what, what you were saying there was, okay, if I can't train distal, maybe I can train proximal hamstring or something like that. So with the calf, it was an example for people listening was, okay, let's say they have a soleus in- injury. Maybe I can do a straight knee isometric calf raise or maybe I can do some calf raises with a straight mm-hmm. knee or vice versa it's a gastroc injury maybe i can do some bent knee so for the distal hamstring that might be i can't do knee flexion extension but i maybe i can do a like a hip thrust type of movement to train like the glute and proximal hamstring yeah yeah 100 find a way it's, it really is be macgyver find a way like you know that might be a reference that's too old for some people but yeah be like oh, actually there's a new remake of macgyver on sky i think anyway but yeah like um, yeah find a way uh, find a way to keep the system alive, find a way to keep them confident and, and find a way to, to, yeah, just keep Put going. Them. Yeah. 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 And then when you say pelvis, so you're like going after the pelvis, um, uh, to be honest, it doesn't matter if it's probably a hamstring injury or any other injury, you're probably going after the pelvis a lot. W- what does that look like practically, Jonas, in terms of like what type of drills can you, would you be thinking about then? Yeah, I guess I'm, um, if we think, first straight line I'm asking my I'm I'm putting a load in their arms I'm putting their upper body in restricted positions I'm challenging them to maybe hold a a rotation um, or just looking at how inefficient they are at integrating their obliques and their shoulders together for this rotation and and I'm I'm wondering and cueing and, and creating stimulus with maybe sticks or balls any kind of perturbation or nothing at all because it's absolutely terrible and I'm just asking them to be stable and I'm doing general drills. I'm doing the normal things that I would do in a performance world. I'm just adding more confusion, more perturbations, more distractions to give them more chaos to try and solve the puzzle. And I think that's important because they won't necessarily have the velocity that they would normally have because they're in rehab. So I'm finding other ways to create perturbations and then I'm challenging them. If I'm looking at them front on, um, we did a research project with Jordan Mendeguccia and, um, and uh, JB Marin and, and a whole heap of guys. I, I was really on the side, but the, the, the outcome of the project was looking at sprint training over six weeks, how, what, what factors change as people get faster. So the key thing for this discussion right now is this term pelvic obliquity which I think is intellectual masturbation. It's just, it's just pelvic drop, right? It's just a nice word, pelvic obliquity. And so, okay, so the question is, when you make ground contact, so if this is my, my left side and I've hit the ground and my pelvis is here, naturally the free hip is gonna drop a bit. The question is, does it drop and stay there and sag or does it drop and bounce? And so that's what I'm asking. From a, when I'm looking at people from the front end, I'm asking, have they got really good lateral control of their start of their stance leg, leg, you know, glute med and everything that really secures that leg, adductor slings that really support that oblique sling? Have they got that control on the stance side that gives them really good pelvic lock, Franz Bosch word, right, um, or pelvic control on the free side? So I'm asking myself these questions. Um, if I'm watching them from the front, also. Um, or from the front, if you can go from above, great. But from the front as well, you might be able to see where is the stance, foot, knee, hip, and how much almost um, rotation on a transverse plane are they going through? My wife calls it knitting. 
Yeah. Are they running on the um, if you're are they running on the line where each foot is landing on the line and having to get a massive pelvic drop and rotation each time? Yep. Or actually, are they landing closer to under each of their hips? Is the left foot landing closer to the left hip? And if it is, can they control the hip or is it also dropping? So I'm asking myself these questions. Are they having massive side sway each step or not? And that's my, that, those are my litmus tests. So I'm doing a, a number of walking, skipping, running drills, forwards, sideways with implements in hand or distractions in the environment that challenge them. And within that, I'm coming back to the simple screen of how can they control their hips? or must the hip drop and roll and, 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 and essentially just have really poor stance limb stiffness and, and poor trunk control during those activities. And then I would regress those activities onto the ground. I, I would make that, like I would start on the floor. I would be doing your typical Pilates, typical core dynamic or type, type work. But in that work, I am really panitiki. Just cause you can do 20 reps, I don't really care. I, I want to know that you did those 20 reps in a way that's going to transfer outside. Otherwise, that you're just getting strong here and it doesn't go out there. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the pelvis, so you're saying like the drop, the rotation that you see, like excessive, um, do you think a lot of that starts with, well, there's no real proper answer, but do you think a lot of that starts with a lack of control in the sagittal plane? Um, oh. I, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're um, separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for example, you can watch someone on the sagittal plane and um, see problems to do with uh, you know, some of the KPIs of sprinting. The knees are too far apart when the foot lands on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. um, lots of shin roll, um, lots of trunk indiscipline maybe to do with this action as opposed to side to side you may not be able to see it those are the same things that you uh, those things identify the same issues that if you watched it from the front so the problem is the problem and it has an influence in everything else so for example if you struggle um and you're going to help me with this terminology if you struggle with actually separating your pelvis like imagine like in a split lunge and you, you can't really open the back leg and you can't open the front leg. So if you struggle with that range of motion and that control, you always have a smaller stride length in running. It's just, so it's from the sagittal plane, we're gonna see lack of hip extent, lack of hip separation, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess all I'm saying here is uh, uh, another one. If you see on the sagittal plane that on foot contact, the knee rolls a lot and the hip drops a lot, if you watch it from the frontal plane, you're going to see massive hip drop. Mm -hmm. You're going to you're going to see a, a lot more valgus. You're going to maybe see them go into pronation and stay in pronation for far too long. So there are signs and of from the sagittal plane that are just symptoms for issues that are really happening on the frontal plane. Yeah, because I've heard Bosch talk about say 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 it looks like like they're they're really spilling over in the sagittal plane. So a lot of anterior tilt, a lot of back extension what he'll often go and coach straight away then is so he might put arms overhead i think so i think he's getting like tension through the abdominals there he might do like some isometric strip for the hamstrings to to stop that knee maybe extending too early which is going to spill into the sagittal plane pelvis and then i've heard an interesting one which was like he goes to the frontal plane i don't want to put words in his mouth either now but he goes to the frontal plane pelvis nice and early so give him back that hip lock and that's going to freeze degrees of freedom in the sagittal plane so give them a little bit more frontal plane control and now they have less room to actually go forward in the in the in the sagittal plane at the pelvis which i thought was quite yeah. interesting and i have found that to be very helpful actually you know so i have no question there but <laughs> that, that was i, um, I definitely agree and really it said differently is my simple way of looking at it is if I can teach people how to project, react, and switch well, it generally takes care of most of the problems. Mm -hmm. Generally takes care of most of the problems. If people don't know how to stack their, uh, spike their ground contact and, and attack the ground and have simultaneous limb action, a lot of those other things happen as a result. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why it's my simple solution for narrow enough everything. 
and it takes care of, again, coming back to the almost the novice coaching eye, if you focus in on those things and get a balance of those things, all of these other issues that maybe are primary causes are solved. Yeah? yeah, and that's the nice way to do it. If you find one solution that creates that, that is actually a was it three birds with one stone? Yeah. That's really what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, yeah. it's usually two birds with one stone, but you you have you are able I'm to take greedy. down an extra one. I'm greedy. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, like I I have a lot of faith in the body in the human body. I have tons of faith in it, and I think like it's able to not figure things out. Like we we need to be coaches, but I think that. A lot of people, you know, so let's say someone comes and they've had five hamstring injuries in the last five years. It keeps happening. All the gym work isn't, it doesn't seem to be helping that much. Like, I really believe that sprinting, learning to move your body in the way that you're getting injured sprinting. You're not getting injured doing a deadlift. Now, I do think you need to get that hip extension before back extension. You probably need to get way stronger at the hamstrings, maybe isometrically, with control over the pelvis rather than just doing nordics going into a ton of back extension straight away but i do i really do believe that we if we can help people actually move better then mm. that's that that's that's the thing that's going to fix a lot of this in the long run and i think that's what's missing so much is just an emphasis on the strength work and then they go back into their old patterns again and no amount of strength as soon as as soon as that fatigue hits hits in the in the body in general and the tissue and then, and then you, you put maybe a poor quote unquote pattern on top of that. No amount of eccentric hamstring strength at some stage is going to, is going to save you there. It's, it's actually being able to have control over your body is what's going to save you in the long run, I think. Oh, 100%. And, and you just have to look to Jordan on that. Whenever I talk on hammies, I, I have to quote Jordan because Jordan has done so much research above and beyond what he really needs to do because he's really a clinician not a not a scientist but mm -hmm. he's probably got yeah an, an immense um aptitude for science and research and he will say it most of his players and he gets the best players from around the world especially football who are repeat rehabbers he said when they come to me they all have the best fascicle lengths they all have the best nordic hamstring scores and eccentric eccentric king kong type uh scores or isokinetic whatever it is um because they are repeat rehabbers. They've mm -hmm. focused on that and it hasn't been the solution. Whereas uh, the pelvis is where he always goes and control is where they always go. And I think my point is always path of least resistance. If, that, if that's your strongest pattern, no matter what, that's where you're gonna revert back to. So if we don't change those patterns and we don't make them robust in high force, high fatigue, high complexity, chaotic type environments, then when you return back to your sport, it's always going to just revert back to what's your path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. So I, I, uh, I totally agree. Yeah, I think I've seen that the same in Ireland in GAA circles now working with inter-county GAA players. The, the, the players that come to me that have like tore, these are serious athletes, serious about their training. They do not want to be injured. They're serious mm -hmm. about their rehab and serious about their strength training. They keep tearing a hamstring and all the Nordboard scores, they're always the best because they've done the most Nordics, they've done the most everything. And then you, you, you watch them, you watch them running, it just doesn't look tidy at all. Yeah. You know? and, and it's not to poo poo Nordics or eccentric strength. No, no. Um, if they earlier. were, if they were doing all the strength, the sprinting work and they weren't doing the Nordics, I'd make sure they were doing the Nordics. But when it's the other way around, I'm making sure that they're actually learning to maybe sprint. Yeah, exactly. And making sure they can integrate the whole system into that immense hamstring strength because listen to this what, what here's a thought experiment if your hamstrings are really strong let's say you're, they're not your path of least resistance you're, you're they are your major assisting um, muscle group and everything you try to do is to use them to stabilize your pelvis to propel you forwards to create co-contractions where they're not um, invited they're trying to do things that they shouldn't do they should be on and off really good explosive actions on and off but if they're on for too long or at the wrong time, that's when issues happen. So it's, it's not about the fact that Nordics or, or better, let's say, eccentric hamstring um, conditioning isn't important, because I think it's important. But the question is, do you want it to be distal loaded? Do you want it to be proximal loaded? Is it, is it time under tension and, 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 and high force that you really need? Or is it RFD and on and off that you really need? Um, is it uh, 
in isolation prone in you know supine where we're really focusing on the tissue actually do you want to have it in a, in a coordinated chaotic type activity those are the more important questions the nordic has been uh, is 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 shooting the messenger i feel like we're shooting the messenger of nord board and the nordic i don't think that's right i think the problem is that we believe that nordic equals injury free and that was the issue and it was nordic it wasn't um uh, hamstring yo-yo machine it wasn't a range of different eccentric hamstrings it was just one exercise whereas i think the best systems have a menu of eccentric hamstring exercise and say for this individual for what we want and how we want to do it we're going to go here for our logistics of our gym and everything we're going to go here right um but i'm off on a tangent really going back to the point that yeah i think if it's your path of, of the place you always go to because you're really strong and you don't enable or allow yourself to turn off and allow other things to try and stabilize you or work in conjunction that's when the issue really happens yeah i'm with you man um last couple of questions for you this one am i right in saying you have a you have something called dribble conditioning yeah 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 drill get, or dribble, conditioning for sure. dribble conditioning or drill conditioning can, can you can you drill into that a little bit and explain what it is yeah it's, it's simple so in early phases of training we talked about short to long right so if i was going to map out a 12-week training program and i was going to do speed let's say twice a week i would and i'm just going to talk about it in three phases it might be broken down a bit more but it's easier for this discussion teaching training transfer those are my three phases i want to teach something when I'm teaching, I'm not just talking. I'm more like creating some low level capacity to do the action I want repetitively. I'm throwing different cues and, and different ranges of tempo uh, at people and using that to learn about them and then to learn about me using different cues, understanding what sticks, what doesn't, uh, helping them and even myself understand cause and effect. You're doing some drills. I'm seeing a toey landing, a lot of side bend. The cause was actually that you didn't attack the ground of your toes up. Okay, cool. We're, we're creating a connection there. So teaching training is when it's more specific. The loads are more specific. The volumes are hard. You've accumulated some really good volume in your first phase. This is now when you're stabilizing that volume and getting some real good stress. You may even overshoot. You might even um, literally push them a bit harder prior to recovery phase. And this transfer phase is when it needs to start to look more like the game you're getting ready for, right? Um, if I break things into those three phases, if I talk about acceleration specifically first, I would be going short to long. I'll be doing more heavy resisted sprints. I'm going to be doing more short accelerations. Gradually in this middle phase, I'll be doing maybe still heavy, maybe some medium resistor sprints. My acceleration distance will be going further. And in this last phase, it will be a mix of everything probably using the one tool that I'm still missing. So if I still need more help with early acceleration, I'm still gonna be doing some tens and some heavy sled prior to longer sprints. If I'm really good at that stuff, at that point, I'm doing my longer sprints, I'm doing my game speed, I'm doing competitive stuff with the ball, I'm starting to prepare myself for returning back to, to sport. That's my acceleration session, but my upright session, if by the end of the program, because we should reverse engineer everything, if by the end of it, I need them to be running really fast, um, being able to run fast under fatigue, be able to be run fast in chaotic environments, I want to make sure that the stage before that, they're running fast. They're running fast, really fast, exposed to maybe distances and, and velocities a bit higher than what they're going to need in the game and being able to do it at a, a semi-repetitive nature. This last phase is going to become more speed endurance and repeated speed, right? Mm -hmm. So I want them to be nearly ready for that. So the first phase, I want to condition their hamstrings, their pelvis, their calves, their motor pattern, their hips, uh, and, and their reflexive limb exchange by doing a range of tempo slash drills uh, under a conditioning environment. So rather than saying in my first phase, I'm just going to do MAS or I'm just going to do extensive into intensive tempo work, 75 to 80 percent running with a work to rest ratio of, I don't know, one to three or whatever it is. I want to use activities that guarantee 
they are stressing the tissues in the way I want to condition them. So you watch anyone do tempo or MAS and they're backsided, sloppy contacts, lots of amortization, lots of shoulder roll, using gravity and over rotating as opposed to applying a force. Well, dribble conditioning and drill conditioning is basically week one is, can you do drills well? Great. Can you do them well over 20 meters? Great. Can you do them well over 20 meters with a 30 seconds recovery and we do it again and we do it again and we do it again. And actually, what do I want for my tempo volume? Maybe a thousand to two to two and a half thousand meters of tempo. GAA is crazy. And you guys have far more running volume in training and in games than I ever imagined. And COVID has taught me that over the past two years. So you might be looking for a bit more volume, but we've coached quite a few GAA guys and we've got away with not doing what you would typically do and having massive effects. So mm -hmm. I would say generally, if you want a nice aerobic general conditioning um, uh, adaptation, we're talking about 2000 meters as being what we're kind of looking for. Well, I'm going to do drills back to back, a range of drills, um, really within the technical, uh, within the skill set of the player, right? Wh wh whatever they can do. And I'm going to do small runs that build to big runs. I'm going to do little ankling dribbles. I'm going to do scissors. I'm going to do side skips, crossover skips. I'm going to do a range of activities that are essentially elastic and ballistic, mm -hmm. but under a fatiguing um, type nature. That's all it is. Drill conditioning, dribble conditioning is a way of preparing for max velocity by building volume and accumulating um, volume and load of more ballistic, elastic switching type actions. Mm -hmm. So that by the time we get to our real fitness work, tempo work, and even speed work, they have a capacity to hold their pelvis in the right position under fatigue. Yeah. Ooh. That, that's been one of my probably biggest changes and biggest takeaways, biggest learnings over the last couple of years when I heard you talk about that was like, for, so I'll try and break that down into my, well, not even my language, just the most simple language. So in, in a GA players traditionally like rehab, but that doesn't have to be rehab. That's just training in general there that you're talking about. Like, okay, I, I do a warm up. Okay. I need to get some conditioning in. I go for a, I go for 10 laps around the field at 50% pace, 60% pace. And the things that we spoke about in the warm up, which might be like that reactivity, that switching or whatever, it's gone out the window. And now I just plod around the pitch and I hate myself for the 10 laps. And so you're saying you can get that conditioning in while drilling some of the things that you're trying to, these qualities that you're trying to maintain through your ankling, through your, your scissors, through your bounding or whatever. And you just go... You just give them less rest, basically. Just give them, you give them less rest. You, um, you choose appropriate distances. You might be going back to back over 10 or 20 meters to start with. Mm -hmm. And our program starts that way. It starts, you're going back to back over 10 or 20 meters. Week two, it's over 30 meters. Week three, maybe it stays 30. And you have a down week and it goes up to 40 meters. Mm -hmm. And you're just growing volume gradually over time. Mm -hmm. And you, you're also choosing some activities that are maybe recovery in nature. So like a general skip, not A skip, B skip, but just generally skipping as a recovery back for one of your reps is, is really important in the early phases because it's easy, it's, it's far less stressful for the athletes and then straight away we're back into elastic contacts. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's the simplest, easiest way to condition all the areas you want whilst um, coach and cue and, and work on technical things that you're going to need to become more habitual in later phases yeah. um, it makes no sense to do anything else now can you mix it with some plodding you're, 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 you're asking them to be hip dominant and have stiff stable ankles in one thing and then plod on the other mm -hmm. and so even when they're plodding so even if I have a, a requirement to do um, more extensive work I'm going to be as uh, strict as possible around their pelvis so even if they're running slower and it doesn't require a stiff contact and it's more economical to allow some amortization and allow a bit more up and down, I'm, all I'm requiring is that they are at least in control of their pelvis. They don't allow their hips to go backwards and that they have decent plantar flexion, um, dorsiflexion prior to contact, that they're at least trying to push and recover, push and recover, even if there is a bit of 
knee bend or landing. Yeah. So yeah. that that would be my requirement. Yeah, I love that. That's that podcast like that. That few minutes there alone, so valuable. I think I do do a little bit of plotting with GA players because I think some of the sport is actually plotting. <laughs> I um, I but but like I spend more time, I spend a lot more time on that stuff that you're talking about, the, the drill conditioning. I'm doing a bastardized version of it, definitely. <laughs> um, and then like more plyometrics and then less time at that 50, 60 percent running where that plotting stuff. And then I'm trying to get them to like 80, 90, 95, 100 uh, percent. But there is some plotting, but way like I would say I, I would say 80 percent less plotting than I would have done in the past. I agree. I mean, I think that's a good number. I was going to say 70 to 80% less than what they would normally be doing. I do a lot of cross conditioning as well. If they need aerobic conditioning, I, I will still put them on a bike, put them in a the pool, get them to do other things as well. I think that's pretty important, um, especially if plodding is contradictory, contraindicating to their injury. Yeah. I think that's something that we all often forget. It's like you've got a poor soleus and the soleus is really important for, for velocity before 70% of your max V and then you allow them to plod and they don't know how to create stiffness and stability in that ankle, you're just making it worse. Yeah. And so actually finding ways to avoid the stresses that are going to make them worse, I think is, is just as important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. Um, okay. Speedwork seems to be blown up as a brand. Am I right? I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. As soon kind as of, I decided that, that I wasn't going to go back to track coaching for a little while, then... My wife says, so what are you going to do then? You can't just stay on the trampoline with the kids all, all year. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's do something. Let's, let's show people what we've been doing. It's just, mm -hmm. let's make it a bit more commercial. Um, you've like worked, none of it's, new. it's just you've worked, maybe. You've worked hard to kind of separate it from just being Jonas. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's, I think that's important because the brand is just me means that if I'm sick or um, sleeping or, you know, God forbid, not here, then the brand stops, right? And, and I've got kids and, and mm -hmm. staff. So um, making it, we, I've just been really open to the people that have come and learned from us. And um, Alan Murdoch her, came as a, as a mentee two years ago and bugged me and, 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 and sat on the mentorship and then did extra hours. And we worked like that for about a year. And then he was like, I, I don't want to go back to club rugby. I don't want to go back to being restricted to doing things that I know are wrong or doing things that are, aren't treating my athlete as my client, but the club and the CEO as my client. Mm -hmm. um, so, so he quit his job and he was worried for, he's like, his, his missus, like they're about to buy a house. It's like, what am I going to do? Like, I, I, I need to guarantee the income. Three months in, he's like, I'm making more money than I was at bar. And I have my weekends and I'm doing what I absolutely love. And a year later, we did a review and he said he couldn't believe it. He thought he would be where he was then, but in three years time. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, Alan's a new addition to the, the team and he's doing a great job down in Bath. And, and we're a year into that collaboration. Marvin Rowe is based in London and he, he runs an Olympic track squad. So he's very, you know, he sees lots of footballers. He, he's had some good good work with local premiership academies um, and some good players that are now, uh, have come through an academy, have played first team and now playing for England football. Same thing for Alan. He's got some really good clients that have gone through their academy, are playing first team for their respective team and are playing for Wales now. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really good to see. Um, so Marvin has a group of track guys and, and does lots of rehabbers down there. Um, Elliot is, is moved over to France, gone home to France, and he started up Speedwork France, and he's dealing with, um, in that, again, with a, a track group um, and, and working in with rugby and football over there. Um, and, and Ryan Grubbs has, has joined us from the States, who um, was working at Liberty University. Now he's at the Texans, um, at Houston Texans, and um, he, he works more in the, in the background with me, doing some business development and, and other bits. Um, and so we, we have a, a range of people growing, um, taking, taking on the mantle and, and running with it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got a group of coaches up here, Owen McNally and Tom Mellings, who, who equally work with our academy group. Owen's got a track group and, um, and has lots of rehabbers and, so, and, uh, and sits in, in, on the computers of us doing all of our, our app stuff. And, and, and online oh, training. I'm so pumped for you. You're, uh, 
the, your, your money arms are growing in every direction. Well, we're trying. I think the main thing to, to be clear about and, and be really open about is my, all of my energy now goes into sharing my expertise with, with everyone and anyone. That's really where my energy goes, be it through mentorship. Um, we have a, a number of Premiership Football Academy and first team SSC staff and physio staff who are on our mentorship and we meet with them at their clubs or they come to us or we do it online. Um, and so we, we work with half a dozen Prem football clubs right now, a few clubs in the Bundesliga and, and, and in, in Sweden um, and, um, and in the States now, a few NFL teams and, and, and baseball teams. And, and most of it is about giving you guys confidence. That's really what it is. If you're a physio and you want confidence in running rehab, you might want some support around understanding some of the stuff we talked about today. You might be pretty well on and be like, actually, I just want a consistent way of measuring kinematics in my environment we've now created an automatic tool to do that so we'll have nfl teams send us 90 videos of 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 their whole squad during preseason, and um, we'll get through those and get those back in a week with with all the accurate kinematics for if you want a dashboard we can do that um, but more specifically just real clear video examples of what needs to improve mm -hmm. what, what what grouping people are in um, and, and where to focus your priorities. So what, what we're trying to do is give people confidence. Don't, you don't have to be a track coach to coach speed. You don't have to be a speed coach to make people faster or help people on their journey to efficiency. You just need to assess and not guess yeah. and just be given direction towards your priorities. Yeah. Or the rumor that every, anyone can get faster. Am I, is, is that? Everyone can get faster. Or everyone, is that the slogan or anyone? Everyone everyone can get faster yeah 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 um last question you're my generic question you're on a desert island for a week no. you bring three people with you not family or friends well they can be friends but oh, they have to be three people you want to learn from they don't have to be coaches in the industry but three people that you think you'd love to learn from oh um I don't know off the top of my head. I'm probably going to say Denzel Washington. Yeah. I like Denzel. And as he grows older, not just as his, as his deep husky voice, quite exciting for me uh, as a straight man, just to be clear. <laughs> um, uh, but he's, he seems to be really wise mm -hmm. in, in his words and, um, and quite inspiring. So Denzel's on that list. Um, I, I like people that are great at systems theory. And there's a guy that I'm not going to be able to remember right now, but I, I'm sure Stuart McMillan pushed me onto him like 15 years ago. And everything he says is, is great and amazing. I'm sure he's gone now, but I, I'll have to find the name for you. But okay. I'm terrible with some names. Um, but he's, he's all about system-based thinking. I like those kind of guys, those guys, the guys that are smarter than me that know how to solve puzzles and create mental models. Mm -hmm. So anyone that sits high in that hierarchy, I'd want there. Um, and then I think I would want um, someone like the comedian Robbie Williams or someone like that, the late great Robin, Robin Williams, is it? Robin. Um, not Robbie. Not Robbie. I, I don't need a tune. I don't need a song, <laughs> sing song. I need someone to make me laugh because I think in his depressive, but a, you know, he's clear, he was clearly a, a deep depressive man, just like Jim Carrey, right? Who finds a way to um, share love, and make people laugh even in the deepest, darkest places. And um, I, I think that requires some kind of fortitude. And, and I think I'd love to be around someone like that to, to, to laugh, but also to cry with, you know? Sounds like a, 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 good, a good week. Um, last question, where can people find you? Or where would you like people to go to? Um, people can find us on Instagram, speedworks.training. Um, same thing on Twitter, but I'll be honest, I'm probably better on Twitter on my, on my personal account, eat, sleep, train, underscore. That's my personal account on Instagram too. Our website is www.speedworks.training. Um, and those are, those are the main places. If you want to send us an email, you want a bit more information, info at speedworks.training or Jonas at speedworks.training. I'll pick up both. We'll put all the links in the in the show notes um jonas you're a legend man i really appreciate what you're doing i like the way i just like you're you're dedicated to your craft you're a good person 
and I think you're making the whole industry a lot better and doing it with a bit of class along the way. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Legends, the legends have collided. Imagine <laughs> before this, I was like, I can't wait for David Gray. I, I need to reach out to him. And David's like, I can't wait for Jonas. And I, I was like, out. I'm afraid to reach out to Jonas. <laughs> <laughs> I have people I like, I have people I haven't asked on the podcast yet because, yeah, I literally thought about this the other day. I was like, I have, I have 40,000 followers on Instagram, right? Which is decent, better than some, not as good as others. But I, I was talking to someone and I didn't realize that like people view that as like a, a, a good opportunity to get their message out there and stuff like that. I, I, I do realize it a little bit, but on the other hand, I'm, I was like, actually when I was at 2000 followers and I looked at someone with 40,000 followers, I was like, they're, you know, they, like I'd love to be on their podcast or I'd love to be chatting to that person. But I didn't, mm. I never, never really dawned on me when it was me. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, if, I, I think, I uh, could be wrong here, but I think as soon as you hit 30,000 followers, you are classed legally as an influencer. There is okay. something around that. Yeah. So yeah. you now have a legal requirement to help everyone get up to where you're at. <laughs> okay. Okay. I need to get a bikini or something then, if that's the case. There you go. There you go. All right, brother. Thank you very much.